All right. Amid the coronavirus uh, COVID-19 pandemic that's sweeping across the world, uh, our beloved industry of indoor climbing is being affected as much as anybody. Uh, and to discuss the implications of this disease on our industry, I've got with me the uh, owner and COO of Ascent Ventures and the pad climbing, Kristen Horowitz, and the owner of True North Climbing, uh, John Gross to talk about uh, how they're coping with things in their neck of the woods. Thank you, Kristen and John, for uh, for joining me. My pleasure. So first question goes to John. Uh, you were one of the first people in our Toronto area talking about the idea of closing proactively. Uh, what moment was it where you decided, okay, I have to take this action and I'm now going to close my gym? So last Thursday afternoon, I heard that schools were being shut down across Ontario. I think earlier that day, I had talked to one of my staff and said, well, if the schools close down, we'll have to close. At the time I said that, I thought we had a week or so before that would happen. And so I was caught off guard. Thursday afternoon, I heard the schools were closing. And my first reaction was, oh, do we really have to close? And I kind of spent that afternoon and evening thinking about it. I sent mail out to several of the local gyms to get their input. Also, my gym is in a large sports complex and I sent a mail around to my neighbors, the basketball place, the parkour place, the go-kart place, and asked what they thought. And I listened to what they said. Probably by the time I went to bed that night, I would pretty much realized we have to close. And I asked all my senior staff to come in the next morning to talk about it. And that morning at about nine o'clock, we decided, yeah, we need to close. I, I had pretty much decided before going in that morning. And we put a sign up and turned away a handful of people who came at 10 o'clock to climb. And probably by one o'clock, we had the, the notice up on the website and you know notified everybody. Kristen, what about you? I imagine your timeline was maybe <laughs> different by a day or two out there in California. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been following it since the very beginning. So happily for me, I'm, I'm very like connected to our community. I have the, uh, I have the, I can hear from directly from the uh, first responders. So ER doctors, ER nurses, I'm actually friends with um, our public health official that's been doing all the briefings. Uh, and so my approach to this was rather than reacting to what was going around us, we needed to make some educated decisions. Um, and actually kind of that's why I, I took the lead in like the climbing gym operator group of trying to calm people down because for example, like schools, I knew exactly what the intent behind closing for schools was and the alarm had not been sounded yet by the people that I was listening to. Um, so we basically got a plan together and said, look, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do, we're going to, we're going to do the social distancing. We let our staff lead it aside from that. So once our staff start to get uncomfortable, then we initiated whatever we needed to initiate. Um, I think by the time we we finally decided to close with a voluntary closure, it was because the Nevada governor had requested closure. And we were like, well, that's it. Because I said when the casinos closed, that's when their alarm was. And the casinos closed Tuesday, and I think we closed Wednesday. Um, and I figured since we have locations in California and Vegas, but my general thing to do there is to, is to do it across the board, whatever we do. So on top of that, our staff, our front desk staff, weren't comfortable working in my home location in San Luis Obispo, California. So it was a pretty easy. My poor GM was the only one that was on board. So he, he spent that last day working by himself and we weren't going to do that to him anymore. So that's kind of how we made our choices. I didn't have the direction from public health or my ER doctor friends. But what I did get, um, which was interesting, is once we decided to voluntarily close, we had a lot of pressure to do it. But then once we did it, and what I thought was going to be right, everyone's like, oh, you did it right. And it was really hard for me because I'd watch people who are other gym owners say, I'm closing right now. And I'm like, oh, you don't, you're literally losing a thousand dollars a day. This is going to help you to continue to go forward. So that's sort of what influenced us is what's our longevity going to be rather than what's like perceptually what we should be doing. So that's how we went. So, so on that, so, topic, so on that topic, I'll just wait for the echo. Wait for the um, echo. Um, so when you guys were making this decision, presumably you had to do some math uh, right off the top. And a question just to get some context of, of what your operations look like when you're closed. Could you guys tell me basically how much income are you getting in this period that you're closed and contrast that against how much of your typical costs you're still having to pay while you're closed? Sure. Um, 
we've lost more than 100% of our income. And by that, I mean, not only do we have no revenue at all, but we've had to refund for some events and programs and a few memberships that have been canceled. Um, I think we're going to be able to reduce most of our costs. Um, most of my staff are choosing to go on EI, employment insurance. Um, I haven't I haven't unilaterally laid anybody off at this point. All the full-time staff are on salary through the end of the next payroll period, which is Wednesday. But after that, I expect most of them will choose to be on EI because there'll be very few hours for me to give out. And I don't know how long this will last. And with no revenue, my only choice is to slash costs as much as possible. So I don't know what's happening with my rent yet. My neighbors and I have asked the landlord to defer or forgive rent. I've asked the federal government to defer or forgive our HST tax payment that would be due at the end of April, which is large. Um, our janitors have suspended service without pay, which helps. Um, if I get the rent forgiven or deferred and the taxes forgiven or deferred, I can eliminate the vast majority of my expenses and survive for a while. Kristen, what about you? So we're a little bit different. Um, I, my husband and I started our gyms as a nonprofit, um, and what we were was a 51C7, so it was a sport organization. Um, and you were not a member of the gym, you were a member of the club, which operated a gym. And so we've had closures before for different things. Probably the most notable one is between when we transferred from becoming a nonprofit to a for-profit because we needed to get loans through the SBA. Um, we closed down for a month and, you know, we, we didn't suspend people's memberships unless they chose to cancel, um, mostly because people understood that we needed to have consistent pay throughout the entire time. Um, and so our, our membership, we were very much membership based, um, organization. We don't pursue day passes for the most part. So I have about 70%, um, auto draw membership. And I think we've only lost about 5% of that since our cancellation. Um, our messaging has been very clear. Guys, if you don't cancel, we're going to have a gym to come back to. Uh, we're going to keep our staff on. We're going to be doing projects throughout it. So, you know, I, I've, I'm seeing we basically get about 15% day pass and event business. So obviously that dropped off. Um, but like what John said, we contacted our landlords. Two of them are small people. So they were like, yep, that's fine. Um, we'll, we'll just look at it month to month. Um, I have one that's very large that's been sending basically like thoughts and prayers emails. So I suspect that I'll have to pay him <laughs> or them or whatever. It's a giant corporation. Um, our My SBA lender actually reached out to me and she actually wrote to me on, on Friday night at like 10 o'clock at night. So like all of these loaners are working really hard and really worried. Like these people are absolutely in it. And same thing when I submitted our emergency loan applications with the SBA, I got the received notifications at night. So those people are working overtime. So my approach has been basically, look, we we are blessed in that we have a membership that's totally supportive of us who gets it. Obviously, people who are going to cancel are going to cancel, and they need to, and I totally support that. But we're able to to actually continue to keep operating, and we're using this time right now to work on ways to add value while we're closed, as well as kind of improve things, which is pretty neat. Uh, and all of my staff, for the most part, are super psyched to do it. So we're finding projects for our people that would usually be doing front desk work. Um, our administrative people are all really like cranking on consolidating policy books and doing all these little cool projects. And I think we're uh, luckily, I think we're going to come out of it pretty well as long as it doesn't last for years and years. But even then I have a lot of faith that there's a lot of bailout there and everyone else is in those positions. So I think that it's really good to look, look presently at what is around you at the moment and, and try to live in that right now instead of forecasting and thinking about numbers so much. Um, I, my next question was basically going to be, how long do you guys suspect you can last within the status quo? The next question will be about what support might show up from local governments or things like that. But have you calculated in your head a timeline of where, hey, you know, I run out of uh, the ability to operate? Uh, yeah, but there's a lot of variables because I don't know what's happening with the rent or the taxes. Um if I had to pay my rent every month and I had to pay those taxes on time, I can last somewhere between a few to several months. The business has been good. I have a reserve. 
certainly not how I wanted to spend it. Um, I'll hang out as long as I can, but my goal is reduce expenses as much as possible so that we can come out the other end and then see what things look like and try to help out the staff who suffered along the way. And I'm kind of in his boat. I think I think you can have death by analysis at this point. I mean, I've obviously stalked the internet mm-hmm. and looked at how China's handled it and I've looked at the the subtleties of it and I've I've heard dog whistles that say we're not out of it until 18 months, but I've also heard like there's a reason why we're all locked down, which maybe by the end of 30 days we'll be able to to start operating again. So I kind of I'm really good at this, unfortunately. Uh, my husband and I also have a vent business, um, and that's very fickle depending on what's going on. And so there's a lot of how do you play with what you've got. And I've also worked a lot with uh, developers, like build, building developers. And one of their things, and, and I'm going to talk about, um, it's, it's not political, but it is a way that most developers, like business, like if you live in a big town or a big city, there are like they know how to play the game. And a lot of people um, will hold certain fees when they need to keep money back and they'll hold certain money because it either doesn't hurt them or they know they can't get at, go after it. And so, for example, if the, my biggest priority is to keep my staff running, if I need to go delinquent on my rent or my SBA bill, I'm going to continue to do so because I know what the consequences of that are. And I also know, and you know, I'm going to quote Matt Roberts on this one because he's the one that told me originally, but I like the phrase, um, which is, Nobody wants your climbing gym. So we're in a really significant uh, situation here where it's not the worst for us because not your bank, not your landlord. Nobody wants to spend $70,000 to remove your gym and get it back. Um, So they're going to kind of have to work with you. Again, I have a really large landlord too, and that person doesn't care. Uh, They'll they'll just let it lay fallow. But for the most part, you know, you've got to play a game with what do your credit cards have? Where what's what's going to happen? And a lot of us who are owners are obviously liable for a lot of this stuff because we've signed the the paperwork, we've signed the guarantees, we've done all of that. Um, but you know what? Like, even if we continue to play that game and we end up in a big hole, if if we're serving the community and we're we're doing it right, I, I honestly think obviously our memberships will slowly start to drop off after a while when people can't afford to keep them going. But I honestly think that this can this can allow a lot of gyms out there to come out stronger if they they use their time wisely and just start to learn a little bit more about like the the Robert Kiyosaki and the like wealth building kind of methods instead of doing it the honest way, if that makes sense, where you make sure everybody is paid on time. And I hate to say that, but I, I, it's one of my biggest things that I've learned that I've tried to mentor people in is just you're taught to, to pay all your bills on time and then and then fall on your sword. Don't do it, guys. You, you don't need to do it. Nobody, the big guys don't. That's why they're big. I have an unusual <laughs> landlord. My landlord is the government of Canada. Oh, nice. <laughs> because um, we're in Downsview Park, which is a crown corporation, and I'm I'm hoping that makes them more forgiving of the rent than other landlords might be. We expect to hear next week. Yeah, and that's probably why you aren't hearing either, because they're probably super frantic. <laughs> So my next question, uh, you mentioned, uh, both of you, John, that you mentioned you were cutting your, your, uh, uh, your revenue basically completely. Whereas Kristen, uh, you alluded that you're not necessarily canceling memberships in this situation. And that's been a decision. A lot of gyms have had to make, uh, and for a lot of people, like maybe yourselves, a decision that, uh, you still have time to decide on depending on where your next billing date is. Um, so can you tell me what the rationale is for, for either of those decisions, uh, for, for keeping your members on and basically forcing them to opt out if they don't want to pay versus acknowledging that you're not offering a service for this duration and instead giving them the option possibly to support you proactively by opting in. Um, How did you guys fall where you ended up falling on that? Yeah, we had a closure once before, six months into our business, we had a big flood and we were closed for 11 days. And at that time we extended all memberships by 11 days, so our members didn't lose anything. The big difference is we had business inter- interruption and insurance, which covered that, and it does not cover this, as far as I can tell so far. I, I think for me, it's, it is a simple question of our members pay for a service and we can't provide it, so I don't expect them to keep paying. We have had a few people offer us money, um, 
my preference is not to make people pay for something they're not getting. And at some point, I may ask them to buy gift cards for future services to get some revenue coming in. And I, I think that would be met with a good response. But at this, I also kind of expect we can survive through this, although the way I'm doing it is by cutting staff. Um, and I've talked to my staff to understand where they are. Almost all of them think they'll be okay going on EI for a while. And, I, and I'm not forcing anybody onto that who, who hasn't told me they think they can handle it. So we may have a few staff staying on for another payroll cycle or two. I'm, I'm not treating every staff equally. I'm asking them what they need and trying to trying to meet their needs as much as I can. Um, and it's a, it's a difficult balance to cut expenses as much as I can and still take care of the people who most need it. Right now, I think I'm going to be able to do that. But again, I don't know how long this will last. John, are, are you having them do things while you're keeping them on payroll? Mostly. When we closed on the 13th, we had published a schedule through today. So what I told them was, if you're on the schedule, we will honor those hours. If you don't need the money and can drop the shifts, you're welcome to do so, and that will help the company. But if you need the money, you still have those hours and we'll try to find something to do. I think most of those shifts, people did come in and do something useful. We've done some maintenance work. We're retexturing a lot of our old holds, some cleaning. Um, but there are a few people who are still getting paid for shifts they're not able to work. And there will be some more of that. Some of my full-time staff haven't been able to come in. And for a little while, I'll keep paying them. <clears throat> but yeah, so some useful work is getting done. Some more useful work can get done. At some point, I might be told people can't go into work. So far, we've had a handful of people keeping their distance from each other, so I'm still comfortable with that going on a bit. Sure. Um, to speak to the same thing, so I already kind of alluded to this, that we have, from the outset, we have an attitude of our, our members are members, and it's not a service we provide, but they themselves um, are what that drives the engine of the whole thing. Um, and that's actually new for the, the gym that we acquired, Origin, um, in Las Vegas, although uh, the owners did a great job of also having that feeling. That's why we acquired them. Um, I've been friends with John for a long time, so I knew his, his vibe for his gym was about the same as ours. And the reason that we choose to do opt-out of membership instead of opt-in. Um, there's the honest reason, which is the same reason why most gyms have initiation fees and suspension fees, which we don't. Um, and that's because EFT is is a thing that gyms have, and if you don't know what that is, electronic funds transfer, um, because people forget about it and continue to pay their rates. Like we are not responsible if they choose to use it or not. And that's why we push them into it. I mean, when we were just doing a development down in Santa Barbara um, and you know, max capacity for that gym is 4,000 people. And the when we told them that, they, they said, uh, you're going to have 4,000 people at the gym. Well, realistically, no, we're not. Uh, you know, some people go every day and some people go once a month and they still contain their membership. So that's a standard thing that any gym does and pushes usually. Um, so I don't think that, that, that choosing to do opt-in right now is really fair to that expectation. I think everybody knows that they're going to need to ask. They've been trained to. Um, and then when we sent the message out, we said, you know, of course, of course, we'll cancel you or suspend you, send an email in. And again, we're paying our staff to go and manage those. Um, but we also ask you, please continue to pay if you can afford it, because your small membership fee is a big difference to the people that are working for you. Um, and then I, I'd also say, you know, it is very helpful. Uh, one of the things I learned fairly recently is the scaling up, which is why we acquired another gym, why we're building some more, is that we have a lot of support higher up to be able to do a lot of cool things in the meantime with that. So it's not just operating a gym We're we're working on like online programming. I, I, I uh, have one thing I developed for other gyms to use, which is like my marketing system for getting memberships. Um, so we're going to be doing a bunch more of that stuff that we use internally that we're going to be making public. Um, so it's like providing services to people in different ways. Um, and then like just include it, improving our, uh, what do you call it? our training and doing all these other things that we can't do day to day because we're running an operation. So I think our membership really appreciates that. I've gotten a lot of really cute support. I've actually had people sign up 
um, to be members when I sent that email wow. out because they really felt the, they really felt it. And I have to say, like, that's one of the things, again, I, I'm really good at kind of suffering and trying to pivot. Um, but it also probably helps that I was a nonprofit because we have kind of a, a vulnerable, open attitude about stuff. So I've been, I've been telling them straight up, this how much it costs, this is what's going to go on. Um, we continue to keep communications going as much as possible. I've had a lot of friends who are members of gyms in other parts of the world um, complain that their gym owners haven't said anything. We knew immediately we needed to get ahead of, ahead of it and lead and like also continue to share our community areas. Like we have a, a bakery that moved into an old location of ours and they're going and they're opening every morning and giving away free bread. Deliver, like they just go out and give it to people and then you can donate. And so I'm like, Hey, remember our old bakery, get over there and go do that. So we're still continuing to provide all of the community we can. We also know right now everyone's going to get real depressed living in their houses. So our, our coach team is working on doing like games and stuff weekly. My head setter is going to start doing things like just little interviews about what's cool about setting and like have different things. So for me, it's not about taking a service. It's about providing service now. And again, like I said, all of those people want us to keep going. So when they open, they need a safe place to be and we want to be there for them. So I don't think it's necessarily a forcing them to do a thing. They know how to cancel and then they can when they want to and or need to. And we totally understand that. So next question is, um, for, for some of us, uh, we're seeing a lot of gyms tentatively scheduled their reopening approximately around the start of April. Uh, for the most part, everybody closed uh, mid-March. <clears throat> Um, and as we get closer to that date and as some states or some provinces are implementing different uh, durations for their sort of voluntary lockdown kind of thing, um, the, the reality of those goals is is shifting. I, I don't know, Kristen, if you uh, uh, assigned a, a date that you may reopen. I know, John, you didn't. Um, my question is, what scenario are you waiting for for you to decide to start to reopen in whatever fashion that is? What conditions are you looking for before you feel comfortable uh, starting business again? I don't know yet. <laughs> I think I think reopening of schools would be a prerequisite. Um, there was one thing I read. Somebody did a little experiment with mixing chalk and sweat and measuring the pH and they believe that the chalk creates an alkaline environment that is toxic to the virus. If I had proof that was the case, I'd feel a lot better about opening sooner because then I'd feel, oh, the holds neutralize it. They don't amplify the transmission rate, which is what I believed when I closed. I thought that we were more of a hazard than schools, for example. Um, even though most of the people who come through are young and healthy and might not get very sick, they could spread it and that's what I was afraid of. So I, I actually, I wrote the CWA and said, hey, you should get researching on this because that might make a big difference. I, you know what, I haven't figured out it. Uh, I will keep listening to the experts. So I'll, I'll decide when the time comes when I feel it's safe enough and responsible enough to do that. I, I'd, love, I'd love somebody to give me the answer to that question. <laughs> Um, to speak to me, I actually, I, I giggled when people made announcements that they were going to open. Uh, I don't think in situations like this, you can control that and or make a promise you can't keep. And I totally believe in under promise and over deliver. So we are not saying when we're going to open and we have no expectation. It could be a year from now, you know, like that's what it is. And I'd rather have people be overly psyched when the opening happens than de like hitting that deadline and then just watching it fade away. Um, and a lot of that is management of perception. And again, like what messaging you're putting out there, what messaging you're telling yourself and what you're listening to. Um, so same thing, like I, as soon as we closed our gym, I was greatly relieved because I was stalking the internet and I was feeling like, am I a bad person for keeping it open? And my philosophy is I'm not the arbiter of public safety. There are people whose job that is. So while I have a climbing gym and I, I you know, like it can be a vehicle for people. It's also, you know, like how many people are going to end up committing suicide because they're isolated. How many people live by themselves? How many people don't have coping skills? And having people be able to go through this pandemic and be able to climb and do things like that, it was really important for me to have a place where they could they could go and have a break. That's what saved me. It's why I am in the climbing industry. Um, as for when it opens, I don't think that's in our hands anymore. I think most places, it's we're getting all shut down. And I think that when that lifts, that's when we're going to have the option to do that. And if we have the option to do that, and the, again, my public safety advisors say go for it, 
then heck yeah, we're going to go. But I don't think there's like a specific condition that you can look for or wait for. And you don't really know, like I, John keeps saying schools and I don't mean to, to do this, but there's reasons why they chose to close schools. Like we have our college closed down and they actually like fully closed it down and they're going to be doing online only semester. So we, they're not going to do graduation or anything through June. They might open, everything might open up again before that. But they've made that choice. And why have they made that choice? Well, because they are set up to do distance learning. They're set up to do that kind of stuff. Um, I know for a fact our, our city people wanted everyone, all the students to leave. So it was a way, I'm sure that they, they worked with the city and said, look, we want the students to go home. Um, we don't want to have to deal with the student population right now. It's not a good idea. So there's so many reasons. And like schools, like elementary schools, there's so many reasons why they made that choice. Um, that it's not necessarily the the Oh, uh, well, I can't hear the word right now. I'll say collaboration, but that's not it. The the caliber calib calibration. There you go. <laughs> uh, it's not the calibration of of what and when we should do it. I think it's just going to have to be when the public service people tell us we can. All right. So all right. So looking forward to whenever that may be. Um, it's not going to be a, a a binary condition where we suddenly switch back to the way things were before. Um, in all likelihood, we'll open up and there will still be some level of transmission of of this disease uh, between people, hopefully at a much reduced rate. Um, but given the the new environment and also the reality that we'll have to live with at that point, are you guys predicting or starting to plan for uh, a different way of operating your facilities? Not yet. I don't know enough. I, I'm thinking about it a bit, but no, I haven't figured that out. Yeah, for us, I, I don't think that there's going to be a lot to change. We, we're we actually in the process of doing a B Corp certification, which is like basically like legalizes us to be a good company to our employees and stuff. And one of the things that they encourage is encouraging remote work and like reducing employee travel. And like, so we are totally already set up to do a lot of work from home. We don't have offices for our admin um, you know, we're growing and we've been doing a lot of remote work comfortably that way. So there's not, there's not a lot of operational changes that we'd be making. Um, but I'm also a bit of a prepper. Like my house is actually on battery power. So we're totally out. We have a, <laughs> um, I actually have livestock so and a victory garden. So I'm a total prepper and I, I heard about the pandemic well ahead. And like, you know, there's things like I don't live, I live by the ocean, but I live on a hill because the water's raising. So I'm a bit of a like tinfoil hat and it's a joke, but I've always prepared that way. And the reality is, is we are in a um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We're at the very top. We're self-actualization. And if, if there's no place for how we operate now, then there's no place for us at all. And and we need to be at that point or else people are going to be depressed. So I don't feel that there's necessarily going to be a big change. It might, I think it's just people are going to be a lot more aware of what happens, you know, before the call, John and I were talking and Toronto was a hotbed for SARS, right? And so Torontoans knew what to do. Whereas here, we're just all mingling around doing whatever we want to do right now because um, a lot of my area doesn't really know what to do. Um, so I think, you know, life changes, but there's a lot of opportunity for good. And I think it's really important instead of being like, oh no, is climbing, uh, climbing jumps over? They're not over. We, we need it. We need it to be happy. And, and I think it's really important that that message gets out there because I see so much negativity right now in the face of fear. And the reality is, is you don't know what's there, but we do know that there's something that makes us happy that changes our lives and we'll continue to do that. That is a, that surprise, is a surprise, surprisingly, surprisingly optimistic op uh, angle to end this on. So I feel like I'm just going to cut it out there. We reached about 30 <laughs> minutes, so that's perfect. Um, I'll probably end up doing one of these every week and I'll change up who I talk to. But for now, I really appreciate both of you giving your context from, from at least different sides of the border and different sides of the continent. Uh, I wish you both the best of luck in dealing with all of this. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Uh, so anyway, thank you, Chris and Horowitz and John Gross. Uh, if you enjoy this kind of content and you want to watch more, please consider subscribing to this channel and we'll see you in the next one.